Well, I've been using my EQ6R mount for about five months now. I've had a chance to do some imaging with a fairly low weight telescope, the William Optics GT81, a medium weight telescope, the Explore Scientific ED102, and now my heavyweight telescope, the Celestron C925 SCT. And so I thought I'd go back and take a look at uh, where I've been and where I am right now with respect to how the mount is performing with respect to guiding and what my impressions are now that I'm about five months in with this mount and share those thoughts with you. Plus, as a bonus, I'm going to give a little comparison here of how the EQ6R mount compares guiding-wise with the EQ8R mount. Let's get started. Well, the Skywatcher specification for the EQ6R tells us that the payload capacity for astrophotography is 20 kilograms, which is actually pretty good. I've got a fairly heavyweight telescope on this mount, and it's only 29 pounds out of the 44 pounds that this mount can theoretically handle. What is meant by a mount weight limit? It's not really weight per se. We're not talking about how much weight can the tripod support before they just collapse and your telescope falls on the ground. We're talking about how well does the telescope perform? How responsive is it? When we achieve a balanced condition, that's when this weight times the distance of 12.5 inches is equal to this weight, the counterweight, times its distance of 16.5. What we want to know is how responsive is this system to RA motor torque. And for that, we need to take a look at the mass moment of inertia. In the mass moment of inertia, now we've got the weight of the payload divided by G to get it into mass times the distance squared. So now this 12.5 becomes a much more significant number because we're squaring it. Plus, we have the payload effect of 22 pounds divided by G times its distance from the center of rotation squared. So this is the number that matters because once we have the moment of inertia, we can now start to talk about how responsive our system is to guiding commands. Formula right here goes into the denominator of this equation. And up on top, we have the torque produced by various sources. First, there is the available torque that our RA torque motor can actually generate. And then we have some static torque contributions. One is if you don't balance your scope effectively, then you're going to have a net static torque that the RA motor has to always resist one way or the other. And then, of course, with some mounts, you get a bit more stiction, whether it's uh, poor lubricant or whether you have some binding between the gears, and the torque motor has to overcome that as well. So once you subtract out the static torque from the total torque capability of the motor, that's the torque you have left to actually perform guiding commands. And you take that torque, the remaining torque, divide it by the mass moment of inertia of your system, and that leaves you with the angular acceleration that's needed to change directions to accelerate or decelerate based on the guiding commands that are being sent. This is a direct measure of the responsiveness to guiding commands. If your mount is near the true weight limit, which is really a mass moment of inertia limit, your mount's going to have difficulty keeping up with the PhD2 guide commands. You're going to see that numerous commands are going to have to be repeated to get the system back in line with what PhD2 is telling it to do. And who knows, it may not ever quite catch up before it has to go the other way. If you see that kind of behavior and you have your PhD2 aggressiveness numbers set to 100%, then you may be near the effective mass moment of inertia weight limit. The first night I took the mount outside for an imaging session, I did a guiding assistant run with PhD2 and had it calculate the declination backlash. It came up with a very wonky looking graph. This is the very concerning thing when I first saw this. So what it's saying is that as the deck commands are being given, the deck axis is moving and then it appears to bog down and then when it reverses, should follow these white dotted line but instead it just continues to bind and then finally releases and comes down and what that left me with was a fairly large 2600 millisecond deck backlash number and sure enough the guiding algorithm tried to make adjustments to deck backlash using this number and found very quickly that it was way too high so something had gone a little bit of miss and it had come up with some odd results that, that misidentified the true 
backlash. Now, it didn't take PhD2 long to recognize that it had a lousy number, and it quickly tossed that out and made some corrections. Three or four months later, when I ran this again with a different scope now on the mount, I got a declination backlash graph that is exactly what you would like to see. In fact, it was much better than I imagined it would be. So the declination backlash proves to be very low with this mount, which is a, a big relief and something I was hoping for because the CGM had such terrible declination backlash that created as, uh, numerous problems during guiding. The behavior that I'm getting now is much more in line with this declination backlash curve from PHD2 than that first one I got the first night out. I'm going to start with a guide log. And for example, here's the guide log that PHD puts out. I just read in the guide log pull out all the pointing error numbers over the full nights of imaging. And as you can see here, I've got about uh, 11 hours of, of imaging time here. So I've just pulled out those numbers. After I get this time series, I then convert it into the RMS, the root mean square guide error. This is consistent with what PhD2 is telling you about your RA, your declination, and your total guide error in terms of arc seconds RMS. What I'm doing is taking this original data back here, dividing it up into 50 second windows, and calculating the corresponding RMS error for declination, right ascension, and then the total RMS history. And that's what you see here. And you can see that it varies quite a bit. Occasionally, there'll be a very low number. Very occasionally, there'll be some high numbers. But mostly it stays, in this case, in between about uh, 0.4 arc second RMS, for example. Now what I do is take all of these numbers and create what's called a probability density graph. And now you can see that I've got a blue curve for the declination guiding, an orange curve for the right ascension guiding, and then the green curve represents the total guiding. And you can see that it has the same kind of variation. Very good guiding down at 0.2 occasionally, but always greater mostly than 0.2 arc seconds RMS. And occasionally as high as in this night, one arc second RMS, but mostly less than one arc second RMS. And then the average is some number in here around 0.4. And now I can take these numbers and create what's called a cumulative probability graph. And I'll show you in the next graphs how we interpret this for our purposes here. I'm not doing anything other than taking the PHD2 log files and then doing some numerical analysis on the data in those files to assess the guiding performance for my different telescopes. The William Optics GT81, that's the lightest weight telescope I've tested on the mount so far. The first one I started testing when I got the mount, and so there was still a bit of a learning curve in trying to figure out how to set the guide parameters for this particular mount and telescope combination. But this is what I got on a representative night using this particular telescope. And you can see that we have the total arc second RMS in here. And if you come over to the corresponding cumulative density function, the way you read this graph is to say, for example, 50% of the time, meaning 0.5, if I follow the 0.5 line over and come to my total pointing error RMS curve, it will hit here and then it will come down to about 0.42 arc second RMS. What that means is 50% of the time during guiding on this particular night, my guiding was better than 0.42 arc seconds RMS. Now, 50% of the time it was worse than 0.42 arc second RMS as well. I'm not that interested in how it performs 50% of the time. I kind of want to know how the mount performs most of the time. And in this context, I'm going to use 80% as most of the time. And so if I put in 80% and come over to the curve, come down, I find that my guiding error, the total RMS error, when imaging with this scope on this particular night, was less than 0.53 arc seconds RMS over the entire course of the night for 80% of the time. Now that's pretty good. Coming from my previous use of the CGEM, where I would be surprised if this number was less than one arc second. So this is a dramatic improvement relative to my CGEM, so I was quite happy when I saw this kind of a number, the Explore Scientific ED-102. Now here the story is, again, fairly similar. One of the nice things that happened on this particular night is the DEC and the RA guiding performance is pretty much very similar, which means that the stars will have a greater tendency to be round rather than elongated. But that doesn't happen all the time. Usually 
my guiding with the RA axis will be a bit worse than guiding with the deck axis because the RA axis is always having to run. You've got the additional gear noise that's feeding into the guiding performance. If we go back to the 80% number, we're back at 0.53 arc seconds RMS for this particular telescope as well. Even though we've gone up in weight, we haven't seen any effect on the guiding at all. All right, now let's go over to the heavyweight scope Celestron C925. I was imaging two targets and you can see that during the first half of the night, my RA guiding was quite a bit worse than what the RA guiding was in the second half of the night. The declination guiding actually looks pretty good all the way through but the first part of the night i was imaging m1 and i believe i was looking over the neighbor's roof and a bit over my roof we we're generating heat from the houses so it could be that i'm getting some local disturbance of heat waves rising up above the roof and then i'm having to guide through that and it could be a contributor here on why it is that this first target was affected in the RA axis anyway, that it, I didn't see when I was imaging M81 more towards the north and not looking over any roof lines. The first thing we're going to do is take a look at the guiding of the whole night, and then I'm going to break it up into the guiding I got while imaging M1, and then the guiding I got while imaging M81. Now, taking all of the data together, now you can see there's a big separation here between the RA and the declination, meaning that I'm going to have more uh, eccentric stars, more elongated stars with this guiding with the behavior like this. I think this is a more extreme case because the RA numbers were so poor early on. 80% of the time my guiding was less than 0.56 which is not much different from the 0.53 that I was getting with the other two telescopes. If I take a look at the rough period of guiding with M1, I've just pulled that data out now you can see there's a you can really see the huge difference between the RA and declination graphs. The guiding graph of the declination probability density function is about the same whether it's the good period or the bad period. The RA guiding is much worse in this case, as you can tell just by looking at the time history here. And if we look at the 80% number, we're getting up to around 0.62. I would be over the moon happy if I saw this kind of a number with my C gem. Now let's look at the smooth period where I was imaging M81. And now you can see that the numbers are much more on par with each other. There is still a difference here between these curves. The deck curve is still offset and lower than the RA error curve. That's to be expected and not unusual. And now if I look at the 80% performance, I'm getting around 0.48 arc seconds, which is even better uh, than I have seen with the other two telescopes. Now let's see how this mount compares to the EQ8. Well, I don't have an EQ8, but I know a guy who does. And Bill Blanchon down in Houston. I'm in Dallas, so he's in Houston, not too far apart. He also has a YouTube channel appropriately named Another Astro Channel. I asked him to just toss me one of his guide logs from his EQ8, and he graciously sent one over. He had a Takahashi 150 refractor, so a pretty heavy scope. These are the results that he got and you can see there is a remarkable difference here it's a very nice performing mount 80 percent of the time he's getting guide error less than about 0.3 arc seconds rms whereas for me in my eq6 i'm getting uh, guide errors less than 0.5 arc seconds but it is interesting to see that a higher quality mount is providing some benefits in terms of guiding also you can see that the performance between the deck and the RA axes is actually very similar. As a result, the stars that he's going to get out of his system are going to tend to be much more round than the stars I'm getting out of my system because I have that separation between the deck and the RA performance. It certainly seems clear that the EQ8R is providing a clear performance improvement compared to the EQ6R, and you would expect that given the price differential of those two mounts. Thanks again, Bill, for shipping this data over to me. I think it's very interesting, and I've always wondered how an EQ8 would perform relative to an EQ6, and I think this goes a long way of answering that question. I finally got fed up with my Celestron c Gem. I bought it new back in 2013, and it did fairly well for a while, but I felt like it was always a bit of a hassle, particularly when imaging it at long focal lengths. I knew I wasn't going to be getting as, as good a results as I could get. And I finally broke down last October and bought an EQ6R. The big problem I had with the CGEM was the backlash, both in RA and in DEC. Well, now I'm certainly very pleased to see that uh, the RA and DEC backlash are almost nil with the EQ6, thanks to the belt drives 
on both the RA and DAC axes, they are significantly reducing the backlash. And as a result, my pointing error is, is spot on. And that opens the door for me to start actually using dithering. I never did dithering before with the CGEM because I never had any confidence of that mount making these small adjustments to pointing because of all the backlash. The EQ6R has about the same worm gear period as the C gym and the periodic error frankly is about the same as the C gym. The stepper motor though that's used in the EQ6R has a lot fewer gears and therefore a lot fewer gear teeth and bearing harmonics that show up in guiding. You can do permanent periodic error correction training. I use Green Swamp Server to do this, but of course you can do it in EQ Mod. It's very simple, uh, but I don't think it's required. Uh, frankly, I've been doing some guiding with the periodic error correction active, and about half the time I've been doing guiding without the periodic error correction active, and I get about the same results. And I think that's about what we should expect. The periodic error is a very slow long period drift that PHD2 can quite easily keep up with as long as you're not operating very close to the weight limit of the mount. I'm not seeing any real benefit out of periodic error correction and in fact I never even used to use it with my c gym because the PHD2 could often handle it and that's what I'm confirming here. I don't really need periodic error correction. I am seeing a total guide error for three of my telescopes and uh, three weight classes less than about 0.5 arc seconds RMS for about 80% of the guiding time, which is actually very good. As I mentioned with my CGEM, I would have been lucky if this number was less than one arc second RMS 80% of the time. It was very rare when I got the kind of numbers that I'm seeing right now with this EQ6R. So it's very good performance. I have no complaints about that whatsoever. I'm not seeing any weight sensitivity with my 29 pound payload. However, there is a guiding performance benefit to an EQ8R. So it's not just the weight capacity, it's actually a better machined piece of equipment and it's providing 0.3 arc second RMS 80% of the time, whereas I'm only getting 0.5. As you might have guessed by this summary, I'm very pleased so far with the performance of the EQ6R. It's out of the box, brand new. I haven't done anything to try to improve the performance of it. This is just open the box, set it up, throw it in the backyard, and start guiding. And the performance is light years ahead of where my C gym was performing, and I'm quite happy with it. But of course, it certainly comes through loud and clear that the EQ8R is a better mount. Okay, guys. Well, thanks for sitting through another discussion. I'll talk to you later. Take care.